everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Flax. I'm the uh, president of the Democratic World Federalists. I think one or two people are grabbing their last thing or two and then sitting down. Okay. I want to welcome you to our annual Good Government Luncheon. Let me first start by asking how many people have never heard of our organization before, the Democratic World Federalists? Anybody? A few hands? Okay. So let me just tell you who we are and uh, what we're about. We are a nonprofit. We're based in San Francisco. And by the way, is this too loud, too low, okay? Perfect, perfect, just right. Terrific. Closer to your microphone. Closer, get closer, okay. All right, I'll get a little more intimate here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so as I said, we're a nonprofit. We're based in San Francisco. Uh, we do most of our events here, but we ventured into uh, to Berkeley uh, for this one. And um, we are, oh, that's what I was saying. yes, and we're, we're part, oh, we're affiliated with the United Nations, although we are pushing very hard on the UN for certain types of UN reform. And we're part of a worldwide movement that began after World War II. The reason at that time, the, the main impetus for it, was to make sure that there would never be a World War III. And the idea behind that, and there were a number of people, many of which that you probably heard of their names who were involved, Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill, Eleanor Roosevelt, and many other names that you've heard, and probably a few you haven't, that the, the idea back then after World War II is if they could create a democratically elected global parliament with a constitution, a bill of rights, a full, full judicial system, just like you would have in a country, then if you had two nations in conflict, like if you know, Germany and France had a dispute, instead of going to war, they can go to court. You can sue. Instead of taking the, the conflict to the battlefield, you can have ways to nonviolently resolve things. Another way to think about that, it's just like in this country. Very frequently, California uh, has water rights disputes with Arizona. We share a couple of hundred miles of the, uh, you know, the Colorado River. But we, you've never heard of a time when we've mobilized our National Guard to attack Arizona, you know, and to take over the river. We just don't do that. Why? Because we have a federal government. We have systems and structures above us that we can bring these disputes to so they can be handled nonviolently. So the idea behind this movement, which started after World War II, was why not do that at a global level? So fast forwarding a couple of decades, the world is different than it was back then, and people who've been involved in this movement realized that rather than just focus on war, if you had this democratically elected global parliament, we could handle some of the other big problems we're facing. Things like climate change, environmental disasters, you know, um, economic calamities, social injustice, things of that sort. And we could do it in a way more powerfully and more effectively than the current structures of treaties and various international groups that we don't know about. They're unelected, they're unaccountable, but they're kind of running the show. So our hope is to create a democratic elected global structure where we the people are back in charge. That's kind of in a nutshell. For more information about that, the board will be sticking around after and be happy to answer your questions. We also have a few uh, books for sale as well as brochures that you can pick up on the information table. The, the uh, what else did I want to add on that? Yeah, so what we're doing is uh, involved in public education primarily and other groups that we work with are involved with lobbying Congress, pushing on UN reform, things of that sort. If you're interested, as I said, you can speak to us afterward, and the packets that you have in front of you has our email address, so you can check our website as, as well as you know, send us any questions you might have. And if you want to personally get involved, again, you can speak with us after. There are a number of ways to do that. Obviously, like all nonprofits, we accept donations, but we also welcome volunteers, and we also welcome people. We have a few spots on our board of directors. We're particularly interested in if people have uh, expertise in things like social media, video production, bookkeeping, and, and event production like this, uh, we're particularly looking for people to help us in those areas. So again, if it's something that interests you, feel free to talk to me or any one of us uh, at the break when we're, we're done with the, uh, the, the speech. So um, I'd like to, before we get to our guest speaker today, I'd like to bring up Jerry Tiedelman. Uh, Jerry is our development director. He is also co-author of one of the books out there, A One World Democracy, along with Byron Blitzos, who will in a moment introduce our speaker. And um, I don't know if, if I, didn't, I didn't clear this with Jerry if I can talk about this, but I don't think I'll embarrass him too much, that um, Jerry ran for Congress in Southern California against Daryl Issa. I think some of you may have 
heard that name. Um, Jerry got, I think, 41% of the vote, 42% or something there. So uh, it was close. Um, but the, uh, the reason we love him in addition to that um, is, again, he is co-author of probably one of the better introductory books uh, that we have on the concept of a global parliament or world federation. It goes by a number of names. So on that note, I'd like to bring up Jerry. He'll say a few more words about us, and then we'll get to our speaker. Jerry. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Why this organization? You know, why? Touch your lip. Touch your lip. Okay, how's that? Why this organization? There's a lot of organizations I could belong to. There's a lot of worthy causes out there. There's a lot of important work that needs to be done in the world. But why choose this organization? Well, that's the question I ask myself sometimes. And it's the reality is the world's in trouble. We're in very big trouble. If you look at what's going on in the world internationally, we have war, we have nuclear weapons being proliferated, uh, we have uh, you know, environmental collapses, something that looms in the future if we don't straighten things out. The world is in serious trouble. And I could work on other issues. I could work on local issues. I could do other things. But I think if we don't solve the big problems, the big problems of international relations, of war, of nuclear weapons, uh, of uh, global warming, these problems can only be solved at the international level. And that's what this organization is about. And the reason I support it is because I see what's happened with the UN. The UN is something that I support. I believe that the UN is the greatest uh, peace and justice organization in the world, and I support the work they've done. I think they've saved millions of people and prevented you know, countless wars, but they've not fulfilled their destiny. They've not uh, you know, rid us of the scourge of war. And the ideas that this organization holds, which is the idea of law, the idea of civilization, of settling disputes in a court of law, or settling disputes in a parliament by voting, that idea is really the basis of civilization. Civilization is based on law, and that's why I support the idea of creating a democratic world federation rather than what we have now, which is a series of uh, you know, alliances, treaties, sovereign states. And the idea is to reform the UN, or more specifically transform the UN, into an effective organization that can really work where sovereignty and uh, allegiance is not held uh, just to the country, but is held to all humanity, meaning that decisions are made based on uh, what is good for, good for humanity. Um, the idea of World Federation is not a new idea. It's been around for a long time. And people misunderstand it sometimes. They think that World Federation is going to be this one big brother government, uh, tyrannical government possibly, uh, but it's not. It's, it's more based on sharing a portion of sovereignty with a higher level. For example, the European Union is probably the best example that's happened in my lifetime. You had Europe. Uh, Europe's been at war for thousands, uh, thousands and thousands of years. Now you have peace in Europe. They were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, because we don't worry about Germany and France going to war, England going to war. We don't worry about that. They settled their disputes in, in a court of law in parliaments by voting. And this can be done at the world level as well, and that's the goal of this organization. The goal of this organization is to bring peace to the world and to actually abolish war. That's right, I just said that, abolish war. Just like slavery was abolished in the 1800s by a movement of ordinary people, so can war be abolished. Just like you know, women won, won the right to vote, it was done by ordinary people pushing for that. Uh, civil rights, it was run by ordinary people, union organizing, ordinary people pushing for it. You have to have, what I learned in politics when I ran for Congress, you have to have the political will. And without the political will, things don't get done. The people have to push and then the politicians go. So that's one of the things I want to stress is that we have to move this conversation of a democratic world federation, of, of reforming the UN, into the political debate. Right now, it's held by a group of uh, intellectuals, professors, political activists. If you look around the room, that's who's here today. Uh, it's not out there in the politics. It's not out there in the media. We don't hear discussions about should we reform the UN? Should we 
uh, have a meeting about it? Should we, uh, you know, remove the veto power that the five nations have? Uh, we don't hear that in the political debate, and that is our goal. Uh, this organization is to bring that into the political debate. You know, we now have more power. I have more power in my pocket than people have had throughout history. I can go on uh, Facebook or the or Twitter and put a message out there. I'm now not just receiving mass communication coming at me, I'm a mini broadcaster. We all have that power. The idea is to use our power to reach out and to create a political will, a debate about how the world is structured. That we no longer accept the idea that groups of humans should hunt other groups of humans. So that's why I'm here today, is to tell you a little bit why I'm passionate about the organization. And I think that you have to get passionate because we're talking about big issues. And this is an organization that can do that. And when a group of people come together, we can get fired up and we can make great things happen. Now, I learned in politics one of the most important things in politics, and I hate to bring this up, but it's the mother's milk of politics, and that's money. Money allows you to amplify your message. When you have a, a thought, a political idea, and you want to get it out there, you need money. The other thing you need is people. You need volunteers. Some people have a lot of money, they donate it. Some people have a lot of time, they donate it. I want to get you involved any way you can in the organization. Come talk to me after the, after the, uh, the next speaker, the event, and let's get going. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll discuss it afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And to uh, introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to bring up Byron Belitsos. As I said, Byron is the co-author of that book over there along with Cherry. Uh, Byron is also a publisher and the creator of or 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 Origin Press, correct? Okay. So, and on our board of directors. So, Byron. Thanks, Bob. Oops. I'm loud there, sorry. <laughs> So, you guys ready for a solution revolution? Yeah. That's the topic of today. I want to say a few words about Kevin, who I find to be an amazing guy, and I've had some interesting synchronicities with Kevin. Kevin has traveled in a, like parallel lines with us in the world federalist uh, trend. We're more politically oriented, and Kevin is more economics oriented. He's, we're interested in global politics. Kevin has been interested in, in global economics. So I feel like we've been running in the same track, but par I mean parallel tracks. And this is a convergence of the two. I started out in this work in the 80s, so I go way back. But I hadn't really thought about economic globalization until the mid-90s, and particularly the late 90s when the WTO was face down in Seattle. And you, everybody knows, right, this is an incredible historic moment of the people from the grassroots demonstrating against a top-down economic dictatorship, really, the WTO. And I found out and verified this is the case. Kevin's organization was a major prominent player in the streets, in the action, in building the coalition that successfully got the WTO to call off their meeting in Seattle. So I, I'd heard about this, this Global Exchanges organization. And then uh, a few years later, I saw a book in, in the shelves at um, somewhere in San Francisco that just jumped out at me. And the title of the book was Insurrection, Citizen Challenges to Corporate Power, forward by Ariana Huffington. This is Kevin's, one of Kevin's 13 books. So I pulled this thing down and like I said, well, who is this gutsy guy that published this book titled Insurrection from a major academic publisher? Well, that was Kevin. So I decided to start tracking on this guy. Then I started hearing about Medea Benjamin. Well, we all know about Medea Benjamin, really possibly the leading activist in the world. She's a co-founder of Code Pink, one of the best grassroots organizations, activist organizations in the country and not the world. Well, then I found out that she the, was the wife of Kevin Danaher. So I just keep running into Kevin Danaher. Then I was started going, I started hearing about the Green Festival. Anybody go to the Green Festivals? So, you know, the Green Festivals, the last one was in Fort Mason, but they, they are in all, all kinds of cities, five or six cities 
all over the country. And then I found out that Kevin Danaher founded the Green Festivals. So he's a true activist, and um, he's also the founder of Fair Trade USA. It'll be interesting to hear about that. And something called the Green Guardians. Kevin earned his PhD in sociology from the University of California at Santa Cruz, truly a radical place. Uh, he wrote a sociology dissertation about South Africa, their uh, apartheid movement, the anti-apartheid movement. And he was a professor at American University for a while on the East Coast, and he came back to the West Coast and was working with Food First, which was a great organization. And it was there at Fru Food First that he came up with the idea of global exchange. And how many of you have heard of global exchange? Very important organization that takes people to third world countries to see what it's like over there, and also to really to, to check out the ravages of the system that we have. So he's been an educator in that way, and also a businessman at the same time. Global Exchange was a nonprofit that had a lot of revenue, so he's been able to power himself with his own entrepreneurial ideas. Uh, as I said, Kevin is the author of 13 books, including Democratizing the Global Economy. What a, that's a great title, and that's a title that should be after our own hearts as world federalists. He's also written a book called 10 Reasons to Abolish the IMF and the World Bank. <laughs> you know, these are great titles. Uh, and then your last book, I guess, is Building the Green Economy. So you can see, you know, Kevin has been right at the forefront of key issues in our world. And, and no wonder the New York Times called him the Paul Revere of globalization's woes. So we're happy to have Dr. Kevin Danaher here. He's a dynamic speaker, and I'm happy to bring him up to speak with you today. Thank you very much, folks. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start with an ad. This is for a great event that's coming up for a video. It's called The Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. There's some flyers around for it. Saturday, April 11th, 2 p.m. at the Diamond Branch Library, De Monde, if you're French, 3565 Fruitvale Avenue. This is a great film about when the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba was confronted with a big drop in their oil and a whole bunch of other things. They went to bicycles. They went to organic agriculture as a nation. They just transformed everything and you got to see because we were going I've been going there regularly since 1979 and we got to see the transformation of the society into an energy efficient society in 2006 it was their year of energy and what they did was they did a national calculation and they figured out that if they offered everybody free refrigerators TVs fans air conditioners mixers teapots whatever all electrical appliances that if they replace them with new energy efficient appliances, the nation as a whole would save enough money to cover the cost of all those new appliances. So a command economy sometimes is really a good thing. You can do that on a national level. We could do it here if we had our act together, but we don't. So just a word about Global Exchange. I've got a stack of Global Exchange newsletters over there, a bunch of my books if anybody's interested. I apologize, I gotta start with a couple negative things, but most of my talk is positive. Many of these things you know, biological systems are collapsing all over the planet. Mother Nature is giving us these dope slaps, right? Species destruction. The number one cause of species destruction is habitat destruction. You destroy a forest, the animals have to leave. The number two source of, of species destruction is international trade because the invasive species, kudzu vines, zebra mussels, Africanized bees, they ride on the trade, and they kind of say, free trade, and yeah, it's not free. Deforestation, we've cut down over 95% of our original growth forests in this country, so when we tell the Brazilians, don't cut down the Amazon forest, they say, oh, like you didn't? <laughs> topsoil is eroding, the US loses 24 billion tons of topsoil a year, that's 3.4 tons per person. Yeah, yeah, we're number one, yeah, we're number one. Landfills are filling up with waste, and I put waste in quotes because waste is a concept. It's a human creation. Nature doesn't do waste, right? In nature, everything is somebody else's lunch. It's 100% recycling. 
even at the green festivals, we hit 98, 99% resource recovery because of the way we do our recycling and composting and every bin is staffed with volunteers to say, no, that goes in this bin, not in that bin. But even we can't get to 100%. San Francisco is number one in the world. We're at 80% resource recovery. But that last 20% is gonna get a lot harder, right? So we gotta eliminate waste. Peak water, we here in California know about peak water. We just had a non-rainy season, two days of rain. Ocean acidification, the oceans absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The problem isn't carbon. Carbon in the soil is great. Carbon in the air and in the water is bad. So it's about where we put our carbon. And the, you can see the bleaching of these coral reefs. The coral reefs are like the soil of the ocean. It's where all the microbiomes happen that feed the bigger animals. Record-breaking wildfires, particularly in the western states. Air quality is declining. The data is there and it's mounting. Black snow, what? This is Greenland, this is soot from forest fires and coal-fired plants. And there's a guy, a really cool guy, who did a thing called the Dark Snow Project, that's darksnow.org, where he calculates the additional energy absorbed by that ice because of the black coating. And it's equal, just in recent years, it's equal to the electricity consumption of the United States over two years. That's how much additional solar energy is being captured by that ice, which of course accelerates the, the melting of the ice. And that leads to glaciers and polar ice caps melting. Um, this thing here is what's called a moulin. This is where the water drills down through the ice when it gets down to the interface between the ice and the rock, it lubricates the slipping of the ice toward the ocean. The West Antarctic ice sheet is melting. That alone will put Miami and the Florida Keys underwater. So don't buy coastal real estate. It's not a good investment. Buy high ground. Ocean levels, when all the ice on the planet melts, ocean levels will rise over 200 feet. This right here will be underwater. I live uphill in Noe Valley in San Francisco. I'm at 144 feet. So good luck to my great-great-grandchildren. This is Manhattan after all the ice melts. Uh, yeah, some of the tall buildings. So the issue will be affordable housing, not affordable housing, but affordable. Can you get your boat to the door? So the question is, what kind of ancestors are we going to be? When I raise this issue of ocean levels rising 200 feet, adults always go, oh, but that's off in the future. Oh, like if you're dead, it doesn't matter, huh? So you don't care about your great grandchildren? We're saying, oh, screw them, right? We don't. It's, it's really unconscionable. Fossil fuel industry is the enemy. That's the enemy. It's coal and petroleum in particular, right? That's who we need to focus on. So you have divestment strategy. The Rockefeller Foundation, funded on oil, they divested from fossil fuel stocks. San Francisco State University, where I teach, yay, we were the first university to divest. Stanford divested recently. There's a big divestment movement on the campuses. They call me up and say, hey, you were involved in that apartheid divestment stuff. Could you tell us how you, and I said, you go to the administration as an ally, not as an enemy. And you tell them, look, these stocks are gonna go down because we activists are gonna drive down those stocks. So you should sell your stock in those companies. Self-fulfilling prophecy. People at Global Exchange, we always do shareholder resolutions. We own some stock in some really shitty companies but it's so we can get into their meetings each year and mess with them and raise these issues. A carbon fee, I call it a fee, not a tax, because people are vaccinated to hate tax. You could tax carbon, because carbon coming into any port in the United States, whether it's coal, gas, or oil, it's all computerized how much there is, and you just put a tax on it, and then you redistribute that toward distributed renewables, right, where each building has its own renewable energy, and you do it, uh, you have to do something to offset low income people not being able to commute and pay high gas prices. Transnational corporations have three genetic defects. They're not rooted in place, they're not green, and they're not democratic. A 2,000 year old redwood tree is not a gift of the creator to be preserved for the appreciation of future generations. It's $300,000 worth of lumber on the lumber market, so you kill it. A fish swimming alive has no value. It's when you kill it. 
and turn it into a marketable commodity. That model will destroy the planet's ability to support us. It's not gonna destroy the planet. People do say, destroy the planet. The planet's gonna do great, right? I mean, you'd do worse taking ants away from the planet. That would cause collapse. Take us away, <laughs> stuff will flourish, right? So the answer is the local green economy, locally owned and green, right? Bioregional sustainability is where we're gonna end up. Imagine a disaster where 6, 000, or 6 billion people die and there's only a billion people left on the planet. Those billion people are gonna do bioregional sustainability. They're going to do local green economy. So seeing as we know that already, let's start preparing for it. Green jobs are actually growing. If you look at the data over the past year, green jobs are growing twice as fast as non-green jobs. And let's be clear, if you're an accountant for a solar company like Sungevity, local in Oakland, started by a buddy of mine, that's a green job. If you're a janitor for a wind energy company, that's a green job. You can't ship a building to China and have it be rehabbed and then bring it back, right? So this is locally rooted jobs. James Madison said, history records that the money changers have used every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit, and violent means possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. The Federal Reserve is not a government agency. It's a private institution controlled by banks. Thomas Jefferson said, we, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations who dare already to challenge our government to a trial by strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. Crush in its birth. I've never used language that violent, right? I'm less violent than Jesus. Jesus knocked the money changers' stuff on the ground, hit them with a knotted rope and said, ah, you're defiling God's house. Okay, they're bankers, they're money changers. Who runs the world? World Bank, IMF, World Trade Organization, Manhattan, Bank of America. You know, they're money changers, right? Are they defiling God's house, the planet? Yes, they definitely are, so maybe we should crush them in their birth. So we have separation of church and state, and that's based on a deeper principle that no one institution should control government. It's supposed to be our property. We are sovereign. We give sovereignty temporarily to government. It's a derivative institution. It derives its authority from the informed consent of we the people. It's why our most important document, the Constitution, starts with those three magic words. We the people. Everything follows from that, right? So we would end corporate welfare. We would build a firewall between corporations and government. End private financing of elections. Stop the revolving door where Cheney works for a defense contractor, then he works for the government, then he goes back to a defense contractor. And where's the hackers to get into that thing that he has that bring it? Anyway, <laughs> the crisis presents opportunity. Yeah, I don't want to go there. We can provide better solutions than elites can. People who ride in limousines with security guards will never solve our problems and waiting for them. You know, if anybody thinks Hillary will fix capitalism, you know, it's like the people who say they're disillusioned by Obama. You have to be illusioned before you can be disillusioned, okay? So we all celebrated, yay, Obama, first black president, right? But if you thought he was gonna fix capitalism, I got some books for you to read. So we need to push this term solutionaries. And I put up Hunter Lovin's book, Climate Capitalism, because it's brilliant. She goes through the book and she shows all these companies that are making money off of the climate crisis by coming up with solutions, whether it's biofuels, renewable energy, what have you. The Rockefellers, for instance. Yeah, the Rockefellers, well, yeah, they are, that's true. Solutionary methodology goes to the roots. Radical, it comes from a Latin word, radix, meaning roots. I always say to people, when you're gardening and you're taking out weeds, do you cut the weeds off at the surface or do you pull the roots out? If we don't change the rules of the game, this notion that growth, you hear all the politicians say, oh, we'll grow the economy. <laughs> Think, that's the ideology of the cancer cell. Grow, grow, grow with no concern about your impact on the biological host. And what does cancer do? It kills the biological host. What is our growth model of capitalism doing? It's killing the bi biological host known as Mother Earth. So there's two definitions of free enterprise. The freedom of big corporations to go anywhere on the planet and do whatever they want to people in nature, or the freedom of everyone to be enterprising. The freedom of everyone to be enterprising is systematically crushed by the power of big corporations. You see all these empty storefronts? 
Amazon wiped out the bookstores and now Amazon is wiping out all the other retailers because they're selling all sorts of stuff now and you can get it delivered and it's easy. You just go on your computer or your handheld device and you order it. Yeah, and pretty soon you'll have no retail sector in your town, right? Just like what Walmart did to a lot of towns. So what are the policies of payback. I mean, I, I follow Brooklyn government and I know why those those stores are going in. Sure. Yeah. The, I, I just I would just like to say that the I the people backing all of this are the same people that are still in And the worst part about it is the destruction of nature by geoengineering and nobody in this group or environmentalists, people who call themselves environmentalists will not say it because they want to enable their agenda of world government, of controlling the human. If you control the human being, there won't be any wars, right? That's the way they think, to squash the human being. Okay, thanks I for that. Runs out afterwards, you can ask some questions. Yeah. I, you know Actually, what? I know I all about geoengineering. I'd like you to stay and uh, pose your you questions. You know what? I just, I'm so upset by geoengineering. I just, nobody in this country group ever mentions it, and we know it's happening. I mentioned we it. We see it. So I, I don't think you're correct. I I, I'm just so. saying this global government is about controlling people. It's about taking away our local government. I'm involved in the Berkeley City politics. I know what they're doing to us. I know what, I know what the ABAG is doing. Okay, so the things I said about local control Sorry. and local ownership it's somehow. About destroying local control. Uh, who is behind then, this you know, global government? Thank you. Appreciate your input. Don't let the door hit in the ass on the way out. <laughs> Triple bottom line enterprise unites social justice, environmental restoration, and financial sustainability. And you see more and more companies using this model. There's a whole group of companies called B Corp. And the B Corp is a legal model, and a lot of states have it now, where the social justice, environmental restoration are baked into the charter of the company when it's set up. So if the company ever sells to someone else, that new owner is forced to abide by that corporate charter that includes social justice and environment. So you've got a solutionary movement, the fair trade movement, the green economy movement, the peace movement, the climate change movement, the women's movement, all of these different grassroots movements around the world are coming together. So we've got a global revolution going on and it's the first ever global revolution. You got things like open source agriculture, this thing, system of re rice intensification. 40 countries collaborating in sharing knowledge around better rice production, right? And this is just one little example. There's thousands of examples like this. We need to celebrate the diversity of solutions. I mentioned these two books, Paul Hawk and Blessed Unrest, amazing book where he documents the millions of organizations, social justice and environmental organizations that are the grassroots base of this global revolution. Naomi Klein's new book is probably the best book I've read in 10 years. It's called This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And she makes the point through amazing research. It's super well documented. You can't fix the climate crisis under capitalism. And I would argue you can't fix the inequality crisis under capitalism. Right now, the UN says we have 285 million people literally starving to death in a world of plenty of food. There, there's no shortage of food yet, right? But it's about the way capitalism distributes that food unevenly. So we want to replace patriotism with matriotism. Do we love one part of the planet or the whole planet, right? And after all, we all came out of a mother. We call it Mother Earth. Your school is called your alma mater, your nourishing mother, your soul mother. We know how to love a place. Think about the Dome of the Rock in Israel. Lots of people ascribe all this importance to that rock because of stories they were told. It's just a rock, okay? So if we can love that rock, we can love the whole planet. We can teach people how to love the whole planet. So here's the paradigm shift. It's science and spirituality coming together against guns and money. You got guns and money on one side, and you got science and spirituality on the other side. If I do an act of kindness toward this beautiful woman here, her serotonin levels go up, it's a neurochemical. My serotonin levels go up through that act of kindness, and anyone who observes that act of kindness their serotonin levels go up. Most of your serotonin is in your digestive system. It's your second brain. So we have the ability to self-cure, right? And this is something that indigenous people knew. Indigenous people, if you go back and you look at indigenous people's culture, their science and their spirituality were integrated. 
Plains Indians, when they killed the buffalo, we know they would use every part of the buffalo. And they would take the skull at the end and they would put it in the soil facing east so that the buffalo's spirit would see the sunrise in the morning. The guys I grew up with in New Jersey would say, that's bullshit. It's not bullshit. They're putting calcium and phosphorus and potassium and other important chemicals back into the soil to feed the grass, to feed the buffalo. They're actually bison, not buffalo. To feed the Indians. So their science and their spirituality were integrated. And we're at that point now where we're starting to reintegrate science and spirituality. The brain science, check out a book called Love 2.0. It's a Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. She's a brain scientist. And she talks about the chemistry in your body when you're in love. Love 2.0, great book. Science and spirituality coming together. The internet is undermining fundamentalism. That's why you're seeing all this backlash by these religious types, whether it's Tea Party or ISIS. or what. By the way, ISIS, the command of ISIS, it's the former Iraqi generals that we kicked out of their jobs when Brenner went in there and shut down the Ba'ath Party and the Iraqi military. You know, total idiot. And the problem with these fundamentalist groups, they took the fun out of fundamentalism, right? It's fun, duh, mental. There's a doctoral dissertation in that word. Science and spirituality coming together. The golden rule in our book, uh, Building the Green Economy, we went through a whole bunch of cultures and you see some version of the golden rule. And now what we're doing is we're unpacking the word others to mean all living things, not just other people. How do we love all living things? And that's better for us. We have the ability to do cross-species empathy, right? This is an amazing thing. And I use a frog because right now there are hundreds of species of frogs in Central America that are going extinct because of a fungus that used to get killed by the cold at night and it's not cold enough at night and that fungus is spreading and it's wiping out species that we haven't even named yet. Do we have the right as one species on this planet to be wiping out other species that we don't even know their names? We haven't even studied them. Perhaps their skin give off a chemical that can cure cancer. This is happening right in the Amazon. They're finding all these plants and animals that have these amazing, not to mention psilocybin and some other cool things. But cross-species empathy does have its limits. You don't want to take cross-species empathy too far. I wonder, is that how swine flu got started? I don't know. Where's the parent? <laughs> Actually, I edited the parent out. The parent is right behind going, oh my god. <laughs> so we're in the early stages of the first ever global revolution. It's a values revolution that is saying instead of having money values rule over the life cycle, we need to have life values rule over the money cycle. If you ask any decently intelligent human being, should we subordinate people and nature to the economy, or should we subordinate the economy to people and nature. Most people are going to get that right, you know, but unfortunately the system right now isn't working that way. So if you ask people which is sacred, life or commerce, they're not going to say commerce. Commerce is something we do. It's like religion, sport, sex. Well, sex is, that's in a separate category by itself, but you, you get my point, right? Commerce is a thing we do in order to get goods that we need, right? It's not the meaning of life. So you ask yourself, if it's guns and money, versus science and spirituality. Guns and money are temporal. They dry up and blow away in the wind. They're gonna go away. Science and spirituality, facts and moral authority are on our side, right? And life is, this is a Bill McKibben quote. I have it on my window in my house. Life is about belonging, not belongings, right? If you force people to choose, most people would choose correctly. We have open source innovation, the Occupy movement. You see the people doing the call thing. You don't need a speaker system. The people that are close yell the sentence out to the next group and they yell it out, etc. And it's not owned, it's not patented or trademarked, it's free, right? And open source, that model, as opposed to the Microsoft, you gotta pay for this, and now we got an update, you gotta call for an engineer to tell you how to use it. That's like buying a car with the hood welded shut, right? You can't change the carburetor without our permission. Right? If the beach were owned by Microsoft, you'd have to get a new umbrella every couple of years, and you know, you'd have to replace the sand and pay them for it. So in the United States, we have a special responsibility. We're 4% of the world's people, consuming 25% of the resources, putting out over 25% of the world's pollution. 
865 military bases outside our country, 240 military golf courses, 180 military schools. I'm sure they're nice schools. I love those kids too, but that's money we're just pissing away that could be spent here on so many things. So the solutions aren't gonna come from the limousine crowd. Now here's something you guys could do. I'll give you the URL that I own. It's called whoownsgovernment.com. And you start a campaign to require members of Congress to wear uniforms. All public servants, police, firefighters, bus drivers, they wear uniforms. So members of Congress should wear uniforms. And if the sign of success in our society is money, then you shouldn't be ashamed of where your money comes from. I'll tell anybody where my money comes from. Social Security, 1200 a month, woo -hoo. You know, try and live on that in San Francisco. But I think you could have a $1,000 prize for kids to go on the Federal Election Commission website, see what you're a member of Congress, where they get their money, go on the corporate websites, pull the logos over, and imagine when they come home for one of those town hall meetings, if about five or six life-size cardboard cutouts were being held up outside the event, the media would eat that shit up, okay? It'd be in the front page of the newspaper and it would lead the evening news. And we'd embarrass the hell out of them because they need to be embarrassed, right? They're basically rented out to these companies. Now here's another thing you guys could do, global voting, right? You say, let's have global voting. And let's ask people, should we destroy the environment or save it for future generations? Should we shut down all the militaries and put the money into healthcare and education? We would win. Should women have equal power with men? There'd be a few idiot men vote against it, but most people would say yes. Should we have a global minimum wage and a global maximum wage? Let's say 10,000 as a minimum and 10 million. Is there anybody here that can't live on 10 million a year? <laughs> you would have rich people and their lackeys in Congress getting up in public arguing, oh no, if you have a $10 million maximum wage, that would inhibit innovation. You got you know, it's like that thing, uh, you know, if you're doing cocaine, that's God's way of telling you you got too much money. You don't need more than 10 million a year, but if you tried to propose this seriously, there would people, it, it'd be great to flush them out and get them out in public and, and have them say why you need more than 10 million a year. So we need long-term consciousness. The masons who laid the foundation layers of the cathedrals in Europe that took four centuries to build, the masons that did the foundation layer knew that they weren't going to see the final product of their work. They also knew they had to do very solid, precise work because of all the weight that was going to come on top of their work. So we need to think intergenerationally. What kind of a foundation are we laying for future generations? And all the biofuels and renewable energy and green building and all this stuff that's just taken off now, that's the foundation of a future sustainable society. Because we're going to have about 9 or 10 billion people before it flattens out, right, population growth. And it's not numbers of people. It's about how heavily does each person walk on the planet. If the human footprint left wetlands and gardens, then the footprint, they, they talk now about handprint. Your footprint is the negative. Your handprint is what you do to compensate for your footprint, like fly less on planes. So Green Guardians is a program we just started a few years ago. This is youth trained in green enterprise skills. And the idea is to get these kids to learn enterprise, but in a way that's about healing the environment and healing our social uh, disconnects. Um, upcycling is taking stuff out of the waste stream. This is furniture made out of cardboard. I've sat on some of this furniture. It's amazingly stable. China's first female billionaire made her money off of U.S. cardboard. She was going around L.A. picking it up herself and selling it. And then she realized, wait, there's all these boxes coming in the U.S from China. She starts shipping cardboard to China, making boxes and selling it to the companies, selling stuff to the US. She's a billionaire, right? So garbage has value. So at Green Guardians, we took out a parking lot. You can see over here, it was just funky. The city gave us money because the city, the city water department wants to get rain into the ground to recharge our aquifers and our springs. We took out the asphalt and cement, and now it's got a whole bunch of crops actually I took this picture this morning so it's up to date and the kids when you see a kid pick a strawberry off the vine and put it in their mouth and they give you that look like wow never did that before 
The boys are learning how to make stuff like pizza off the crops, and they understand this is going to help you with your girlfriends. It's really good. So they're focused on cookies and pizza, right? And that's stupid. They're good kids. I have one kid, he comes up to me. He's my best student, actually. I was working out in the garden, and he came off the street one day, and he goes, hey, can you make money doing this? I said, yeah, you can make money. You want to learn how to do it? This kid now, when I ask him, what's your career track? He says, food, agriculture, food, cooking, et cetera. Awesome kid. So this is a building project at 16 to Mission. The city owns this lot. They just issued an RFP. And what we're trying to propose is a Green Mart Eco Mall based on 13 years of Green Festival. You put your local green companies in there. You have lots of events at night. This is a 36,000 square foot space. It's huge. We've got it scoped with a pocket park and a garden, a farm up on the roof, 5,000 square feet. That's probably about, you know, eight times the size of this room. You can grow a lot of food and sell it to the food court, and the food court can pay ahead of time for the food. So you fund the soil and seeds and everything with a pre-purchase from the food court. And there's some really good groups involved in this. The housing is going to be all affordable and homeless families because it's city-owned. The city is only charging $15,000 a year for the land. So that's really cheap. It's on a barge station with two major bus lines. It's a great location. So final thoughts. There's two kinds of analysis. The analysis of the way things are and the analysis of the way we can make things be. And it's that latter analysis of the activist that we need to implement. There's we're very tolerant people, but we should have no tolerance for cynicism. Cynicism is what passes for insight when courage is lacking, right? It's the intelligent coward. Oh, yes, Kevin, I understand all these problems, but I'm getting my personal thing together here on the planet. You know, yeah, right, I've heard that, and I never saw you out at the demonstrations. The Titanic is the corporate economic model. It has struck the iceberg of unsustainability, and it is sinking. So we have two possibilities for our politics. One is to run around the decks of the Titanic with protest signs, this boat sucks. And I've done that and been arrested many times doing it. The other is to build the next boat, a solar powered, wind powered boat, party on deck, scantily clad people dancing to music with drinks in their hand, and people will jump willingly to our boat. Right, it's what Buckminster Fuller said. Don't spend your time critiquing what sucks build a better system. And that's what's going on around the world. That's what we do at the green festivals, and that's what uh, I put my energy into. We need to make global revolution fun. This was taken at the Washington DC Green Festival. It's a women's percussion group. And these young women come into that event banging on their drums and just like juice everybody's energy in the whole place. And they go up and down all the aisles, and they're amazing. But if it's not fun, like Emma Goldman said, if you revolution, if I can't dance, then you revolution. Don't you know? Don't count me in. And I'd leave you with the prime directive, which is from William McDonough, who wrote the book that I always recommend to my students. Um, it's called Cradle to Yeah, Cradle to Cradle, and it's about how we need to create a closed loop economy, everything totally reused. And he says, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? If that was the prime directive, and all policy came down from that prime directive, we would fix all these problems. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And we have time for questions, comments, criticisms, suggestions, 